now that we have the ability to read whole genomes and have access to mega computing power, it's possible to analyze the billions of bases of genomes in ways that just weren't possible before. For example, when we look at the full genome of most species of flowering plants, we find strong evidence of many ancient whole genome duplications, events of polyploidy, occurring over the history of these plants. It's even possible for us to estimate how long ago a particular genome duplication took place. They're still very rare events, but with over 100 million years of history and scores of diversifying lineages for flowering plants, there are a couple of dozen genome duplications that we can detect. It also looks like at least some plant lineages underwent explosive diversification, that is, they underwent much higher rates of speciation shortly after these polyploidization events. For example, the grasses, crucifers, and legumes are all extremely diverse plant lineages, and their speciation bursts seem to follow one or more genome duplication events. It's also evident that the ancestors of flowering plants underwent two genome duplications in rapid succession shortly before they subsequently diversified in the spectacular way 100 million years ago in the early Cretaceous. Darwin himself saw this sudden explosive abundance of different kinds of flowering plants in the fossil record and considered it an abominable mystery because of how quickly the diversity unfolded. One has to wonder if these genome duplications were the triggers for periods of rapid evolution. Polyploidy is now a topic of intense interest because of its potential importance in the evolutionary history of flowering plants. You know what another group is that's undergone multiple genome duplications over its history? Vertebrates? Yeah, that includes us. Applying the same kind of analysis used to detect ancient polyploidization in flowering plants, we see that all of the vertebrata also share at least two whole genome duplications, while one group, the fishes, has undergone additional polyploidization events. Now, of all the vertebrates, which taxon has the greatest species diversity with the highest rate of speciation? Fishes. Coincidence? Perhaps. But bottom line, multiple polyploidization events have occurred in the histories of at least vertebrates and flowering plants. And these events may have facilitated rapid evolution as seen within these lineages. As I warned you about earlier, we had started with this as a possible mechanism for sympatric speciation, but we quickly got sidetracked by much bigger questions. Whole genome duplications may have had a big role as turning points in the evolutionary history for plants and animals with backbones. Horizontal gene transfer. Before moving forward, I need to make good on my promise to qualify my earlier statement that with cladogenesis, the species boundaries are complete and never again will there be any movement of genes into or out of the genome of a species that has parted ways from its closest relatives. It turns out that this is not so much a hard rule as it is a general guideline to which exceptions occur. For example, a few years ago, I treated myself and my family to the holiday present of having our genomes done. We spit into our tubes and sent them in and we got the reports back and, well, I found out that I'm Asian. I actually found it mildly interesting to go through the report thinking about what kinds of conclusions could be drawn from the DNA of the few select pieces of my genome that they isolated and sequenced. For the hundred bucks you give them, they're not going to sequence the entire genome. Just select bits here and there enough to recover the single nucleotide polymorphisms, the SNPs, that give predictive information on your phenotype, how likely you are to experience sleep disorders, or have wet or dry earwax, or have a distaste for cilantro. One interesting bit that they include in the report is the percent of the genome that is of Neanderthal origin. My result was just over 3% Neanderthal genes, which is actually on the low side compared with most of the samples done by the company that I used, 23andMe. This also was not too surprising. 
modern humans, that's you and me, and Neanderthals split ways about 400,000 years ago and evolved their species identities through allopatric speciation on different continents, modern humans in Africa and Neanderthals in Eurasia. Neanderthals went extinct about 40,000 years ago, but not before they had extended periods of sympatry with the modern humans that had migrated away from their home continent and into the range of the Neanderthal. Every modern human, except for those of undiluted African blood, traced their ancestry to these early migrants, and every one of them has some Neanderthal heritage. Caucasians the most, Asians somewhat less, and Africans generally very, very little. If any, it's thanks to a very ancient and very small migration of the northern humans back into Africa, bringing with them a little bit of Neanderthal blood. Point is, Neanderthals and modern humans are distinct biological species. They largely maintain their species identities despite overlapping in range for tens of thousands of years. And yet, there was some interspecies hanky-panky that has led to a fat handful of Neanderthal genes bopping around the vast majority of humans today, long after the extinction of the last Neanderthal. When the genes of one species makes it into the genome of another species, this is called introgression or horizontal gene transfer. And while we presume this to be either rare or non-existent in the days before next generation sequencing, we now know that, hey, it happens all the time. That reproductive isolation we talked about earlier is less an impermeable brick wall as it is a very sturdy wooden fence with an occasional space opening between the boards. If you look in the horse genome, you find a handful of donkey genes. If you look in the donkey genome, sure enough, there are some horse genes. Coyotes have some wolf genes and wolves have coyote genes, even though the two species remain separate as ever, even with the overlap in the ranges. But horizontal gene transfer does not cause all of life to meld into one single species. And this is because it's rare and its effect of making the two species more similar is more than compensated by natural selection that keeps the two species from evolving into something different, something between themselves and another species. If our ancestors had a few incursions of genes from other species, Neanderthal and maybe the Denisovans, which were another species that overlapped with modern humans, it's likely that most of those alleles have been eliminated by natural selection, and those that remain are still around the human species, either because of dumb luck or because they actually offered some fitness advantages to those humans carrying them. Okay, here's a little thought exercise that recaps and brings home many of the concepts we've been discussing so far, particularly where it comes to microevolution and speciation. It requires us to return to something we talked about in lab. Remember the metapopulation, the population of populations, where instead of there being just one freely mixing big population, we have instead several smaller subpopulations with little exchange of migrants between them. Say we have six subpopulations of 100 individuals each. The metapopulation as a whole has a size of n equal to 600. Let's think about microevolution as it occurs in this metapopulation, both at the level of the whole metapopulation and within each of the subpopulations, taking each of the four microevolutionary forces in turn. How does each force contribute to the evolution of reproductive isolation? Natural selection. Okay, so we have six populations on six separate islands. How could natural selection result in the evolution of species isolating mechanisms? Well, let me make it clear that we don't need to presume that the conditions are the same on all of the islands. It's possible that each island presents its own challenges to which the resident population adapts over time. For example, if food is abundant in ponds and freshwater streams in one island, while there aren't such habitats on a different island, then I could imagine that the population on the two islands would become different because of natural selection, 
one population becoming more aquatic and the other population becoming more terrestrial. Think about this some more on your own and come up with a couple of other scenarios in which natural selection could result in the evolution of differences between the populations as each adapts to its own home island. Random genetic drift. Let's start with the presumption that there are no differences between the islands when it comes to natural selection. The populations are all subject to approximately the same selection pressures. Remember that each of the six populations has its own history of allelic evolution due to random genetic drift. Given enough time, drift will result in the fixation of one allele or the other. Populations 1, 3, and 4 become fixed for little a, while populations 2, 5, and 6 become fixed for big A. If you look at a different locus, it might be that 1 and 5 become fixed for big B, while 2, 3, 4, and 6 become fixed for little b, and so on. So you remember that random genetic drift is causing each population to become less variable, right? Every time drift causes one allele to be fixed, there is the loss of the other gene. But now, if you look at the differences between the populations, they're becoming more different over time. So while we're losing genetic variation within populations as a result of drift, at the same time, we're increasing the variation between the populations. Can you see that? In the context of speciation, these differences between populations will add to the genetic divergence resulting from different natural selection on the different islands. In other words, the two microevolutionary forces both contribute to what may ultimately cause two biological species to split away from each other. Mutation. Given enough time, there will be some number of mutations occurring randomly in each of our six populations. Every so often, one of these mutations may actually increase in frequency and even become abundant. But you won't be seeing the same mutation arising in different populations, right? Each population will have its own unique history of mutational change. And in this way, mutation will also contribute to the divergence between the populations in a metapopulation. Gene flow. So far, we have been presuming no migration or any other gene flow between the six subpopulations in our metapopulation. If we were to relax this assumption and allow for a small rate of gene flow between the populations, what is the effect on variation between the subpopulations? Are they going to become more similar to each other or more different from each other? What about variation within each of the subpopulations? Will migration increase or decrease the allelic variation within the populations? Well, you should have said that the effect of gene flow on the metapopulation will be to make the populations more similar to each other. That is, there will be less variation between the populations. Well, at the same time, it causes each individual population to become more variable. There's an increase for allelic variation within. And you might have noted that this is exactly the opposite of the effects of random genetic drift, which make the populations more different from each other greater variation between, while well, the effect on each individual population is to make it less variable. It isn't wrong to think that random genetic drift is a friend to the process of evolving species isolating differences, while well, migration is an enemy to speciation. All right, so thus far, we've been talking entirely about microevolutionary forces and how the micro-scale changes that they cause from generation to generation accumulate to cause larger scale evolutionary change over great amounts of time. But that's not the same as macroevolution. Macroevolution is all about stepping back and looking at even bigger scale patterns and the forces underlying such patterns. And it's not simply macroevolution taken over a long time, or at least not always. I have a little extra time here, and so I'll do a bit of the setup for the first example of the next lecture. 
If you look at the evolution of horses, they first appeared in the fossil record in the early Cenozoic with Hyracotherium, a four-toed browser that was about the height of a German shepherd. Later in the Cenozoic, which is the time from 65.5 million years ago to the present, Hyracotherium was gone, but there was a later relative, Neohippus, that looked a lot more horse-like. It was bigger. Its pinky toe was highly reduced, and its teeth were taller crowned and better for grinding grasses. Fast forward to the Miocene, which is an even later time in the Cenozoic, and Miohippus is gone, replaced by larger, even more specialized Merecahippus. And if you fast forward again to the Pleistocene, Merecahippus is gone, and we have the immediate ancestors of modern horses, even bigger and more specialized. All but one of the toes on its feet have been lost. Let's just focus, though, on the evolution of horse body size. It seems that horses have gotten bigger and bigger throughout their history. The earliest, Hyracotherium, was small. The latest, Equus, large. There isn't much to discuss here. This increase in body size is the macro scale pattern, and we want to understand what was the force underlying this increase. So in this case, it is actually possible that the increase in horse body size over 50 million years can be explained by microevolution. As far as our microevolutionary forces go, the only one that could result in sustained increases would be directional natural selection. Genetic drift and mutation are random in direction. Migration shouldn't apply at the level of species changes because species are supposed to be isolated gene pools. And so the one microevolutionary force that could explain the macro scale pattern here is natural selection favoring larger body size in horses. So far, so good. If microevolution is all we need to understand this general increase in horse size, then there's no need for anything other than microevolution. This is essentially our null model. No macroevolutionary mechanism, that is, other than plain old Darwinian natural selection, is at work. Now let's think about why selection might favor larger horses. I mean, if we're going to implicate natural selection as the default cause for larger body size sustained over such a long period of time, there must be some way of justifying an inherent fitness advantage to being larger. Well, it's not terribly hard to make this case. I'm only going to give you one example because some of you may soon be writing an essay on this question and I don't want to do your work for you. If you ever get around to studying the physics of animal walking, running, and swimming, you'll learn that there's a relationship between body length and the efficiency of locomotion. How many calories are required to move one kilogram of body mass over one meter? If you can do this with fewer calories, that is greater efficiency. And it is absolutely true that other things being equal, larger, or to be precise, longer bodied animals are more efficient. This advantage of body length is most pronounced in the water when the animal is swimming. But there's also some advantage to being longer when walking and running on dry land. Flying not so much. But since we're thinking about horses, this argument would be consistent with natural selection favoring greater body size in horses due to greater efficiency in locomotion. Keep in mind that there are plenty of other arguments that could be given where larger body size is favored. And there's another raft of arguments that could be given to argue that smaller body size is favored. All I'm saying here is that if there were one or more of the bigger is better arguments that were important enough to actually drive directional selection for the horse clade over its 50 million year history, this would be a situation where the macro pattern can be totally understood by simply microevolution, natural selection scaled up. Remember that we're still talking our way through the null model. We're starting out with a line of reasoning that does not include any special macroevolutionary mechanism other than microevolution. So what I just presented is a narrative in which the body size of horses increased as a result of 50 million years of gradual directional natural selection for larger bodies. 
Microevolution is all we really need to explain this macro scale pattern, and so nothing else is necessary. But look, this null model makes a prediction that the evolutionary change in horse size is a more or less continuous procession of increase over 50 million years of Darwinian selection. What kind of evidence would lead us to reject the null, the notion that the driving force behind this increase in size was natural selection? In the case of horses, the fossil evidence actually paints a picture suggesting that we might need to reject that null hypothesis of natural selection. You see, any of these named and pictured horse species on this chart is not just one specimen with a fixed body size. Each is represented by many fossil samples for which there's phenotypic variation. Moreover, many of these species were successful over a long time duration between their first appearance in the fossil record and their eventual disappearance. In other words, we have early, middle, and late samples for many of these species. Now, thinking about these well-represented horse species, the null model of natural selection slash microevolution makes a prediction about body size in these early, middle, and late samples from a given horse species. The latest America hippus should be larger in size relative to the earliest ones, right? That's what you have to expect if directional natural selection for larger body size were occurring on these horses. But that's not what you see. The earliest and latest examples from these horse species are not significantly different in size, and if there is a tendency for any change in body size, it's actually in the direction of smaller bodies, not larger. So there's at least one piece of evidence against the idea that regular Darwinian natural selection is what's responsible for the macro pattern of increasing body size in horses. By the way, the idea that there's a general trend toward increasing size in animals over time, like what we've been thinking about with the horses, is commonly referred to as Cope's Rule, or Cope's Law, after the American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope. As I brought up in the footnote to an earlier lecture, some of the figures in the history of science that have been memorialized by naming something after them, some of these guys turn out to have expressed patently reprehensible views over the course of their careers, and Cope is among them. It's for this reason that the current trend in science is to not name things after people who discover them. Instead of Cope's rule, we might say the rule of increasing body size. This hasn't caught on yet, so for now I'll stick with Cope's rule. One of the options for the first essay assignment will focus on a paper reporting on an analysis of body size evolution, basically an evaluation of whether or not Cope's rule is supported by evidence from living and extinct seals, sea lions, fur seals, and walruses. But do you think that Cope's rule is supported by the data from horses? Why or why not? In the next lecture, We'll start by following up on the horse example before moving into other macro scale patterns that do require more than just microevolution.